The Bolton Pool Defiant was born from the idea that a fighter aircraft with a single turret could successfully engage and destroy enemy bombers and fighters. Introduced in the late 1930s to RAF service, it did see very limited success in the early stages of World War II. During the Battle of Britain, however, the shortcomings in its design were realised and it was removed from daylight operations, taking up a reasonably successful role as a night fighter. Join me in this video as I build and review the 172nd scale plastic model kit of this interesting aircraft from Airfix. Hi, I'm Matt and you're watching Model Minutes. Before I start the video, a quick shout out to my patrons. A massive thank you to you for the support you give me. Take a look at the links in the description to find out how you can get involved. So today's video focuses on a build and review of the Airfix Bolton Pool Defiant in 172nd scale. For a detailed review of the sprues and contents of the box, take a look at the unboxing video I made on this kit. Before I start the build, as always, please remember that adult supervision may be required due to the use of sharp tools and toxic paints and chemicals. Airfix recommends this kit to those aged 8 years and older. The plastic parts were washed in warm soapy water and then left to air dry. This step helps provide a good clean base for paint and cement to stick to. Humbrol 78 cockpit green acrylic paint was then thinned with Tamiya acrylic thinners at a ratio of about two parts paint to one part thinner. This will help to avoid leaving brush strokes but may result in a number of layers being required to get a good finish. Using a medium brush I then painted all the internal areas of the aircraft whilst they were still on the sprue. This process was then repeated with Humbrol 33 matte black acrylic, again being thinned, but this time used on the other parts that required it. This included the turret components, control panel and machine guns. Whilst all the paint was drying, I decided to construct the propeller assembly. The various parts including the spinner, backplate, prop and locating pin were all removed from the sprue either using snips or a sharp knife. The excess plastic could then be carefully cut away or sanded smooth using a nail file. Tamiya extra thin cement is used throughout this build as I like the way it flows into gaps, bonding quickly and is easy to apply thanks to the included brush in the pot. The prop is cemented into the spinner and then the back plate added to the rear. The locating pin is pushed through the plug component and then the pin is cemented into the back plate of the propeller. The plug should not be cemented as this is what allows the propeller to turn freely when it's installed in the aircraft, so be careful with that glue. The fuselage halves were next to be removed from the sprue and cleaned up. The front bulkhead was cemented into one of these halves and then this was followed by the internal sidewall details. You will notice that these have been painted using Humbrol 33 matte black whilst on the sprue. I found it needed a little cleaning up in order to sit correctly inside the fuselage. A similar detailing component is also needed on the other fuselage half. Again, this was removed and then sanded down to ensure a good fit. Removing the paint from the bonding surfaces will help ensure a good contact surface for the cement. The remainder of the cockpit components are now assembled. This consists of cementing the pilot seat to the floor part, along with a control column and rudder pedals. If you want to include the pilot, this would be a good stage to add him, but I have decided not to add mine to this build. This assembly is now added to one half of the fuselage. I found that it fitted quite well, with only a little encouragement needed to get it in the right location. Next, the mounting part for the turret is added. Again, this went into place with a minimum of fuss. The control panel was then given a coat of humbrol decal fix whilst the control panel decal was soaked in warm water. When the decal had released from the backing paper, it was slid carefully into position on the control panel. It was pressed down with a brush and a further coat of decal fix applied to help soften the decal into the surface details. The landing gear bay was removed from the sprue along with the lower wing surfaces. The landing gear bay can then be cemented into place. I quite like the way Airfix have done this as one part, as it looks fairly well detailed and prevents you from making any mistakes. The upper wing halves are now added to the lower wing halves. 
These fit really well with only a little fiddling required to make sure they align just right. The control panel decal has now cured and the component is cemented into place inside the fuselage. I used tweezers here as it's quite a small part and can be hard to get it in the right location. With that cemented into place, the fuselage halves can now be joined together. I ran the cement along the seams and held them in place until it had cured. The two halves join really well, but I did notice an ever so slight misalignment on the nose. The fuselage can now be joined to the wing assembly, simply slotting into place and being cemented. The fairing behind the turret comes with raised or lowered options. I chose the raised component as I intended to depict my aircraft on the ground, and whilst the turret is not in use, this fairing would be in this position. The component simply slots into place and cement can be run along the seams. The elevators and rudder can now be added to the model. Care must be taken here to make sure that they don't droop or hang to one side when they are installed. You might need to hold them in place until the cement has cured to avoid this. The rudder comes as a separate component, which allows you to place it off-centre if you wish, giving the impression that the aircraft is being controlled by the pilot. Sadly, the elevators and ailerons would need cutting and repositioning if you wanted to depict these items in the same manner. At this point, I am now ready to begin painting. You might be able to notice that I've left some components off the model, particularly the wheels and air intake. I'll add these later, after painting, as it would make it more difficult to paint them at this stage. Humbrol 33 matte black acrylic paint was thinned with Tamiya acrylic thinners at a similar ratio to that previously mentioned, and then, using a large flat brush, the entire model was given a good thin coat. A number of layers of this paint will be needed to get a good even finish, but I found that the paint went on really well, and there are very few brush marks in the finish. The other parts, including the air intake and landing gear covers, were also given a coat of this paint at this time, ready for their installation later. The air intake was now assembled. I've already given the radiator grills a coat of Humbrol 11 silver acrylic paint. They are then cemented inside the radiator cover, which is then glued into its grooves on the bottom of the aircraft. Had I added this part earlier, it would have been more difficult to get the black paint inside the radiator area. The air intake on the nose was also assembled in a similar manner, then added to the model. The landing gear legs come in a number of parts, some of them being quite thin and small. They had to be carefully placed in position and then cemented together. I had to take care and use patience here, making sure that I was accurate with my placement. I used tweezers to help me get everything in the right place, and I was actually surprised with how sturdy these legs ended up being when assembled. Here I'm building up the turret. This can be quite a difficult step due to the thin and small parts. It's worth noting that if you intend on installing the gunner figure, you will have to do so now, omitting the long base part as a result. I wasn't including this figure, so the long base is cemented into the circular ring. The gun housing comes in a number of parts. The guns need cementing to their connecting rod, then the housing sandwiches them and is glued together, but not to the guns. This will allow the guns to be traversed up and down if you so choose, so be careful with your placement of glue here. The aerials on the bottom of the aircraft are now removed from their sprues and cemented into their holes in the model. There is one at the front and one at the rear, but this rear one needs cutting if you have the landing gear lowered. In the real aircraft it would protrude during flight, but be retracted on landing so it would not strike the ground. Only a small amount of this aerial should be sticking out of the aircraft, so I cut it to the correct length and glued it in place. Now it's time for another coat of thinned Humbrol 33 matte black acrylic. This will cover the entire model and help hide any chips or missing areas from all the previous additions to the model. The cockpit canopy and turret were painted using the same paint, but this time straight from the pot. I'm using a fine brush here, following the moulded frames to correctly place the paint. If I get any in the wrong place, I can gently remove it using a pointed tool, which is possible to do with acrylics. A couple of coats will be needed to help hide any unwanted clear parts. 
Humbrol 53 gunmetal grey was used to highlight the barrels of the gun and give them a more metallic finish. The turret canopy was now added to the turret assembly. Carefully passing the guns through the moulded slots in the canopy, it was then placed into position. I used Tamiya extra thin cement to bond the parts together. You do run the risk of fogging the glass up if you use poly cement, but my reasoning was that there was a thick painted band at the bottom that might hide that part getting fogged up, and I was only applying a small amount. Fortunately, I was lucky and the clear part did not fog up. But at the end of the day, it was a bit of a risk. A general purpose glue or PVA would be a safer option. Humbrol 135 acrylic satin varnish was thinned with water and then brushed over the entire model using a wide flat brush. This layer will help protect the previous layers and act as a base for the decals. A satin or gloss base will help prevent the decals from silvering, which a matte finish can cause. Whilst the varnish was drying, I painted the hubs of the wheels with Humbrol 56 aluminium acrylic paint. I used a fine paintbrush to try and avoid placing it on the tyres. When dry, the wheels were then added to the landing gear, adding small amounts of cement to the holes and pushing them onto the legs. The landing gear covers can now be added to the legs and bays. This can be a little fiddly and you may have to use tweezers to help you. Some paint might have to be removed so that you get a good bonding surface for the cement. With the majority of the build near enough complete, it's now time to apply the decals. The sheet was cut into more manageable parts, the decals then being submerged in water, which allows them to release from the backing paper. Humbrol decal fix was applied to the relevant area on the model, then the decal slid into place. It was carefully positioned and then more decal fix brushed over the top to help soften them and make them appear painted on. I thought the decals were a little thick, but they went on really well and when they had cured looked great. Whilst you watch me finish this step, I'll tell you a little about the actual Bolton Pool Defiant. Introduced to RAF service shortly before the outbreak of World War II, the Defiant had been born from the idea that a formation of turret fighters could intercept enemy bombers from below and upon focusing their fire, successfully engage and destroy the enemy. At the time, the concept seemed to be sound, but following the first few battles against contemporary fighters, following the declaration of war in 1939, the weaknesses of the design were realised. German fighter pilots often initially mistook the Defiant for similarly looking hurricanes and as a result would dive on them only to be met with a hail of bullets from the rear gunners. Realising that the Defiant had no frontal armament, the German pilots would exploit this weakness and as a result increasing Defiant losses forced them to be moved to a night fighter role. It found reasonable success in this role, and was even retrofitted with an early form of airborne radar, but was superseded by faster and more potent aircraft such as the Bowfighter and Mosquito. Not quite the end of the story however, the Defiant found itself in roles such as training, target towing, air-sea rescue and experimental duties. The Defiant Mark I featured a crew of two, a Rolls-Royce Merlin engine which could power the aircraft to a maximum speed of 304 miles per hour and it was armed with four 0.303 inch Browning machine guns in a hydraulically operated dorsal turret. With the decals now applied to the model, I sealed them in by mixing Humbrol 135 satin varnish and 49 matte varnish with some water and then brushed this mix over the entire model. I blend these two paints together as I found that using just the matte varnish will result in a white residue. The satin varnish prevents this and the result is a near matte finish which I think looks quite good. I highlighted the tail wheel leg with some Humbrol 11 silver along with some parts of the main landing gear legs. I did a little research and most of the leg was painted black but some parts were silver. The propeller was now installed carefully using Tamiya extra thin cement to hold it in place. You might be able to notice that I've used Humbrol 24 matte trainer yellow acrylic to pick out the tips of the blades. The turret assembly is pushed into place, taking time so as to not damage the paintwork. This will not be glued in as it can be rotated when it is in position. 
The landing lights were cut from the sprue, cleaned up and then glued into position. Here I'm using a general purpose glue that won't react with the clear part and fog it up. You must make sure you get the right part in the right place on this step. This was then followed by gluing the cockpit canopy into place. As previously mentioned in the unboxing video, you are given the option of displaying the cockpit open or closed and have parts for these choices included in the kit. The engine exhausts have already been given a coat of Humbrol 53 gunmetal grey and it is now that I cemented them into their slots on the nose, taking great care to not ruin the previously applied decals and paint. Humbrol 171 Antique Bronze was then dry brushed onto the engine exhaust to give a slightly rusted finish. The paint was removed on a paper towel and then the residue applied to the exhaust with the raised details collecting the paint and giving an interesting colour variation. And that's as far as I went with my build of the Airfix Bolton Pool Defiant Mark 1 in 170 second scale. I thought about applying more weathering such as oil and exhaust stains, chipped metal and the like, but at this stage now I thought it looked so good in this sleek black finish that I simply didn't want to ruin it. Particularly the shark's mouth standing out against the black nose is very effective. So what do I think of this kit? Well, I think that it's great. I love the amount of detail, the fact it comes with a pilot and gunner, the assembly is relatively easy, and the fit of the parts is good. It also comes with different options for displaying the cockpit canopy and landing gear. The instructions are easy to follow, and the decals are well printed, and apply it to the model with no issues. As previously mentioned, there is a slight misalignment on the nose of the aircraft, which you might be able to notice in the photos, but that might be more of an error on my part in the construction than in the design by the people over at Airfix. Retailing for £10 in the UK at the time the video was made, I feel this is a reasonable price to pay for such a good little kit of an interesting subject. As you know from my previous video, I was fortunate enough to get it slightly cheaper at £8, so even more worth the money. Although marked as a skill level 1, and I didn't have any issues during the construction, I feel that the slightly fiddly turret could put some beginners off. That being said, the all black night fighter paint scheme is pretty simple, so it would be a good practice piece. If you wish though, decals are provided for another version in a camouflage scheme. The version I chose to depict was that of a Defiant Mark I of 151 Squadron RAF Wittering in February 1941. The tooling for this kit dates to 2014, so it is one of the more recent kits in the Airfix range and it is up to the standard we have come to expect from these newer releases. It certainly leagues ahead of the previous offering from Airfix, which dates from the 1960s, and if I can find my version of that one, which is hidden away in the stash part built somewhere, I'll have to do a comparison. So, in conclusion, I think this is a fantastic kit of an unusual and slightly odd aircraft which would make a great addition to any aviation modeler's collection. As always, let me know what you think of my build, techniques and finished model in the comments below, and don't forget that you can also leave suggestions on other kits or videos you'd like to see on my channel too. All that's left to say is thanks for watching, and I'll see you all on the workbench again next time.